It is a joy to have this time together to study God's written word together. If you grab your personal Bibles with me and turn to the Gospel of Luke, we uh, will finish chapter 1 today, Lord willing, and what a joy it's been, um, the first seven sermons that we've had to, to journey through this wonderful account um, that the Lord has ordained for us. Last week, we, we studied the first half of Zechariah's a prophetic song of praise after the birth of his son, John. Uh, today we pick up where we left off in verse 74. But before we jump in, for anyone who's just joining us, let me just quickly remind you of the events that have unfolded here in chapter 1 that Luke has given an account of amazing ways in which God has been at work. Uh, prior to the beginning of this um, of these events and the lives of these people, the Lord has been silent for 400 years. Um, and that's a long time. And so we begin in, chapter, in verse 5, chapter 1, to see that God breaks his silence and brings his word through the angel Gabriel to Zechariah. Zechariah is a faithful Jewish priest. He has a faithful wife named Elizabeth. They're both very elderly, have lived long lives uh, for the Lord, and they are still without a son to call their own um, because God has ordained that Elizabeth be barren, uh, unable to have children. And they've prayed for a lifetime that it be God's will to give them a son. And the word that the angel brings to them is that God has heard their prayers and Elizabeth will bear a son. And God will do amazing work to open her womb and she would be pregnant. Uh, not only um, will she have a son, but a son will, who will be great before the Lord, who will do great things for the kingdom of God. He will be the announcer of the Christ, the long-awaited Messiah, uh, to point um, the people to Jesus for salvation, for the forgiveness of sins. Uh, Zechariah, upon hearing this news, was filled with doubt because they were, again, very old. And so how can this be? My elderly wife is going to bear successfully a son. So the Lord chastises and disciplines him for his doubt and makes him unable to speak for the duration of the pregnancy. Um, surely a work that the Holy Spirit has in store for him in that time. Um, during the pregnancy of Elizabeth, uh, we also are given testimony in this early chapter um, of the angel Gabriel visiting another in that community, the um, young teenage girl, Mary, um, who is told that she too will bear a son, even though she is a virgin. And uh, that boy um, that she will give birth to is the Messiah, the promised Redeemer of God's people. Uh, Elizabeth goes on to successfully carry her child to full term and give birth despite her old age. And at the just the crescendo of all of these happenings, John is born. The Lord brings another miracle to give Zechariah his voice back. And with his first words, he sings praise to God for all that he is and has done. It is here, church, that we get to witness the words of his song of praise. Uh, that song begins in verse 67. Um, let me read you 67 and 68 for a little more table setting and reminder of where we are. It says, And his father, Zechariah, filled with the Holy Spirit, prophesied, saying, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people. Notice with me again, church, that Zechariah is told to be filled with the Holy Spirit, and therefore his song of praise is also considered prophecy, meaning what he's going to speak is the word of the Lord, and therefore it's the promise of the Lord, and therefore it's going to happen because God fulfills all of his promise. And so not only are we hearing this great song of praise to God from a faithful man, but we're really getting to hear what is going to happen um, in the, the seasons to come, the work of the Lord, what he's doing and will do. So as we study this song, this prophetic song, uh, I shared with you my hopes last week, and I remind you of them again today, that we too, like Zechariah, is praising the Lord. He's resting on the promises of God. The church, we too, would rest on the promises of God. 
on, on, on the fact that he sees his promises through with perfection. That, he, that we can go to him, we can trust him in faith despite what's happening. We can do this with such vigor and such joy that we too, like Zechariah, well up with worship for God and sing a great song of our own to the glory of the Lord among those that the Lord puts in our presence in these days he gives us under the sun. And so with that, church, let's read the entirety of this prophetic song, and then we'll return to verse 74 and pick up where we left off last week. Luke 1, 67 through 80. And his father Zechariah was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied, saying, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel. He has visited and redeemed his people and has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David, as he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets of old that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us, to show the mercy promised to our fathers and remember his holy covenant, the oath that he swore to our father Abraham to grant us, that we, being delivered from the hand of our enemies, might serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all our days. And you, child, will be called the prophet of the Most High, For you will go before the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation to his people in the forgiveness of their sins. Because of the tender mercy of our God, whereby the sunrise shall visit us from on high, to give light to those who sit in the darkness and in the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the way of peace. And the child grew and became strong in spirit. And he was in the wilderness until the day of his public appearance to Israel. Join me, church, as we dive in here in verse 74 and 75. Zechariah continues. He says that we, being delivered from the hand of our enemies, might serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all our days. Uh, Zechariah continues to say that we are being delivered from the hand of our enemies. That He's already spoke to this great gift of God back in verse 71. We saw this last week, that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us. This is good news, church. News that all of us who belong to Christ by faith are delivered from our enemies. It's good news because it truly and completely changes how we live our lives. In Romans 8.31, Paul boldly says, If God is for us, who can be against us? In Romans 8.37-39, he continues, In all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. We are more than conquerors in Jesus. In the power of God, who can be against us? Yes, we are delivered from the hand of our enemies. How saved, how delivered are we from our enemies and those who hate us because we belong to Christ? So very delivered and so saved that we can love our enemies and do good to them. Now watch this, church. We're not just delivered from them, meaning, you know, they can't get us. Think about the shift that this makes in our lives. Think about how it changes everything. Paul instructs the redeemed of God in Romans 12, 20, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. For by doing so, you will heap burning coals on his head. Not only is God delivering us from our enemies, but he is empowering us to minister God's love back to them. Think about that. Instead of fear for them, instead of avoiding them, the shift is so major. We are so delivered. I can minister to them? We can do this because God has taken hold of our lives. 
He has secured us by His power. Right? We're not vulnerable to be lost. Right? We're not going to get so far down that road and somehow we're going to be snatched up. No. We just read in Romans 8, none of these things can separate us from the love of God. Another place we see this kind of talk is from Jesus himself in John 6, 39 and 40. This is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he's given me, but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. Church, we who belong to God are secure in God's supreme power and protection. He has us. He will not lose us to anything or to anyone. That is true deliverance. Not only does sin and death no longer have a complete grip on my life, but I'm protected by God from those I once feared. The first blessing he highlights here is that we get to live and serve God without fear. See this with me. That we being delivered from the hand of our enemies might serve him without fear. When a person is truly saved by God and given faith in Jesus alone, we're taken hold of by God. We're forgiven of our sins. We're empowered to no longer fear our enemies. To no longer fear the, the, t- the happenings of the temporary, the loss of created things, even loved ones that we hold dear. It allows us to change our grip on all of these things. We're given eyes to see the incredible value of who we are in God's eyes. The amazing cost that He paid to purchase us, to ransom us from our sin through the blood of His Son. We're given freedom. Freedom to fear no longer. Church, what a blessing it is to be delivered from the hands of our enemies and therefore to get to serve God without fear. That we can walk into any place and know that whoever those enemies are, however atrocious, however violent, however, if God has his people there to be redeemed, they will be redeemed. That there's no authority that is higher than his. No one has claim on them that is higher than his. Paul understood this, and I love how he says this in Philippians 3, 7, 11. Whatever gain I had, I count as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish. In order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which that comes through faith in Jesus, the, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection, that I might share in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible I may attain the resurrection from the dead. I had to work really hard to not include what Jesus is going to say later in Luke's gospel. That we should fear no one who can kill the body, but only the one who can keep it forever in hell or redeem it forever to be with him. I mean, that's what Paul's talking about here. That The deliverance has freed me from the grip that these things have had on my life. And I'm free to serve him. I'm I'm free to die. Because he has me, and I'm forever his. So what are my enemies going to do? What are they going to take? Compared to Christ, all of that it is of comparison like rubbish. Not that it is rubbish, but in, in the comparison to the vastness of the wealth and, and, and who Jesus is. 
And then notice something with me here, because we can struggle often to turn our deliverance, to turn our salvation into something that's just for us, and we can kind of keep it in a selfish mindset. But, but notice something Zechariah highlights here that I think is really important, that we're delivered unto service to the Lord, that we, being delivered from the hand of our enemies, might serve Him without fear, might do the Lord's work, without fearing the opposition, that we do it in holiness and righteousness before him all our days. Many times we love the outcome of deliverance, of freedom, and if we're honest, our flesh can loathe the idea sometimes that that freedom is to be put to work for the righteousness of the Lord, for the in righteous ways, for the good of the Lord, the good of others. Uh, this is back to a constant point of emphasis that I am hoping that we continue to do business with church, and that is that our faith, our church life, our deliverance t- shouldn't end with us. It is a great blessing and joy to be saved and delivered, but we have to see what God saves us unto. He, he doesn't just save us and call us home. I mean, for some, for very few, the thief on the cross and others that you might have heard of a rare testimony were on their deathbed or at that moment, right before they died, God saved them. Yes, and there's a unique testimony the Lord wants to go to work in that. But for most of us, he saves us and then commissions us to go back into this dark world that hates God and hates the gospel and is so against him to be a light of Christ, to to serve them, to show them something different. That we would honor the Lord in these days he gives us. This is how Paul's able to say, I'm not living for this stuff anymore. I'm, I get to live for him, to know him, to even join him in his suffering and his death on the cross. That we see that we're saved from slavery to sin unto being slaves of Christ, unto being servants of the Lord. Christ says that the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And how did the Father send the Son? The Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, to give his life as a ransom for many. That these days the Lord gives us, that they get to now be lived for his kingdom and, and for his glory and the good of others. Jesus says this again and again. The apostles will go on to teach the early church this again and again. That this short life that we're given to know the Lord and serve the Lord after we're saved, until he takes us to glory, is to be one of sacrificial service for the glory of the Lord with hopes that they too, the people that we serve, would, people we testify to would come to know the Lord and join us in that effort until he calls us home. Notice one other clarity that Zechariah says about serving him without fear, that we, being delivered from the hand of our enemies, might serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all our days. The key is not only that we would do the right and sacrificial thing, but that we would do it for the right reasons, for the right audience. Right? So you notice with me that we do this in uprightness and righteousness and holiness before Him all our days. Right? Colossians 3, 23 and 24. Whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Christ. And so this is how, as when salvation comes to our home, it begins to really affect all of our lives. With sweet clarities of God's truth, I begin to break through the lies. I begin to break through the idolatry. I begin to break through the things that all of this had a grip on my life. And I It changes the economy of my home, of my days, of what I love, of what I'm into, of why I do what I do, why I don't do what I don't do. My relationships, my marriage, and my children, and with others. um, Changes how we work, how we make money, what we do with that money. 
of the priorities of our home. It, it goes to work in all these ways. See with me, church, that being delivered from our shackles to sin, Christ at work in us, is an empowerment to live in holiness and righteousness before the Lord with all our days. This is a wonderful blessing of God on our lives. I mean, talk about purpose. Talk about meaning for our days. We get to do this. This is what Zechariah is celebrating. Moving into verse 76, notice with me that Zechariah turns his attention towards his newborn son. He's singing the song. His newborn son's right there, John. He says, you my ch- and you, child, will be called the prophet of the Most High. For you will go before the Lord to prepare his ways. Jesus, the Messiah, Son of God in flesh, is referred to as Son of the Most High. The angel declared this of him in verse 32 of this very chapter. He will be great. This is speaking of Jesus. And will be called the Son of the Most High. And here, just a number of verses later, Zechariah refers to his newborn son, John, as the prophet of the Most High. The angel of the Lord declared what Zechariah's child, John, would do back in verse 15 through 17, that he will be filled with the Holy Spirit, Even from his mother's womb, he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. He will go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready for the Lord a people prepared. Consider with me the words of the last prophet of the Lord to speak the Lord's words before those 400 years of silence. We find that in the book of Malachi, chapter 4. And if you look down with me to verse 5 and 6 of that chapter, Malachi prophesied, he said, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. And he will turn the hearts of fathers to their children and the hearts of children to their fathers. Sound familiar? Lest I come and strike the land with a decree of utter destruction. The Old Testament prophecy of hundreds of years before, generations before, spoke of the return of Elijah. And in knowing that, many would go on to see Zechariah's son, John, John the Baptist, that to think that he was Elijah in some kind of reincarnate state. We'll see later that John himself will deny that, say that's not the case. Jesus makes it clear as well in Matthew eleven thirteen 13 through 14, He says, for all the prophets in the law prophesied until John, and if you're willing to accept it, he is Elijah who is to come. John is not some kind of reincarnation of the Old Testament prophet Elijah, but is ordained by the Lord with a very special anointing of a man who would do the ministry of Elijah in the New Testament era as the forerunner of Christ. He's the announcer, the prophet, as Zechariah refers to him here, of the Most High. I I can't wait to dive into John the Baptist ministry testimony. We're going to see that later in chapter 3. One of my favorite of all of Holy Scripture. See with me, though, while we're waiting for that, that Zechariah gives us a look ahead in this prophetic song at the focus of John's ministry in preparing a way for the Lord. Verse 77, Luke 1, 77. He goes on to say, to give knowledge of salvation to his people in the forgiveness of their sins. John, this prophet of the Most High, will give knowledge of salvation to his people in the forgiveness of their sins. We know that this is what John goes on to do as we peek ahead to Luke 3.3. 3. He went into the region around the Jordan proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. John's assignment given by the Lord God was to announce the arrival of the Messiah, the Redeemer, the only one who can truly save us from our sin to give awareness and knowledge and insight into this most amazing fact that he's here. He's 
arrived, all the generations that have waited. Let me ask you, do you have awareness and knowledge of the only way that you can be saved from your sins? Paul says in Romans 6.23 that the wages of sin is death. The wage, in other words, what I earn because of my sin, my breaking God's law and commands, is death. Is separation from the holy God who is life and life eternal. In our sin, because of our sin, we experience spiritual death. That means even though you are alive and seemingly doing well, that apart from Jesus, salvation, faith in Christ alone, you are spiritually dead. This means that you have a real and complete separation from the one who is life, God himself. Understand that this is mankind's core identity apart from Jesus. It's our most sobering reality, a complete and utter spiritual slavery. Paul says it this way to Titus in Titus 3.3, 3, For we ourselves were once, speaking of about Christians before they were saved, were once foolish, disobedient, led astray, slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice, and envy, hated by others, and hating one another. You don't have to say, man, I know that really applies well to a life lived before Jesus. All the ways we live for ourselves and not for the glory of the Lord. All the ways that life was hard and broken, full of misery. God warned Adam that this would happen if Adam as our federal representative our federal head of mankind chose to disobey God Genesis 2 16 and 17 the Lord God commanded the man saying you may surely eat of every tree in all of the garden I can't imagine how amazing that was but of the tree of knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat for in the day that you eat it, you will surely die. Did they die physically? No. They died spiritually. Adam and Eve chose sin. They disobeyed God. Sin came into the world through one man, Adam. And we who are given that seed of sin, practice and continue sin in our own lives, were separated, therefore, from the holy God, rightly. Adam and Eve were cast out for their defilement, and that's God's perfect legal sentence, a just rendering of the judge. Why? Because God cannot and will not relax his holiness, or he's not holy, perfect, pure. So what must be done then if we are in death? Right? A righteous Sentence for our sin, a perfect legal sentence for violating God's holiness and his command on us. What must be done for us to be made spiritually alive? Death must be paid. Lifeblood must be shed. And so a system was put in place. The system of the old covenant had its blessings and its consequences connected to it and also it's pointing to the fulfillment the antitype who the one who would come to get it done why so hebrews 9 22 without the shedding of blood there is no forgiveness of sins god's system he puts forth is a system of atonement where the priest would make sacrifices on behalf of the people blood of the animal would be shed but it's insufficient Hebrews 10.4, it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. So there was provisions in the Old Covenant system that, that this was to God's people, His Old Covenant people, but it also was a picture of what was to come for true salvation. The only one who can make a means and deliverance for true salvation. The blood of animals was insufficient to cover our sin. No, there must be death, there must be blood of another. 
This is where the ministry of John came into a very important view. He and all the generations of that old covenant practice is going to announce the forgiveness of sins by the Redeemer, the promised Messiah, the one who can and will bring our deliverance, our salvation. Titus 3, the next couple of verses after the verse I just read, when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, he saved us. In his kindness and love, God sent the Savior to save us. Church, salvation belongs to the Lord. Praise God that in his free will, he chose to save us. I think especially when we slow to consider the depth of our condition in our slavery to sin, in our spiritual deadness, it is truly amazing what God has done to save us. Uh, Paul speaks so very eloquently of this reality in his famous words that we find in Ephesians 2, 1 through 5. Hear them again. Hear them fresh, church. Let it well you up with real and full praise, Christian. You were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among who, whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and we were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. How absolutely dead and utterly desperate we are in our sin for the only one who could save us, deliver us, Redeem us. And he did it. The story of mankind should equal us drowning in our sin, in our despair, slipping away into ruin, consumed by our enemies. Feel the weight of our condition in death, our condition in slavery to sin, our condition as children of wrath. He owed us none of his love and his mercy and his grace. But he chose freely, full of mercy, full of love, to save many. Romans 3.25, God presented Jesus as a sacrifice of atonement through faith in his blood. 1 John 4.10, this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. This is what the Savior was coming to do. The blood of Christ would be shed in the place of God's elect. And it's the only sacrifice that would do that would be sufficient. And so John is charged to give knowledge of salvation to his people in the forgiveness of their sins. What a moment. What, what game-changing news this is. Not only for them in that day, but for all of us that God has come to save. And so with that understanding, what Zechariah says next means so much to us. He says in verse 78 and 79, Because of the tender mercy of our God, whereby the sunrise shall visit us from on high to give light to those who sit in the darkness and in the shadow of death. Praise God for his tender mercy. Amen. God who is rich in mercy, as we read Paul say a moment ago, for his sovereign decree is to rescue many from the darkness, to cause the light of Christ to shine on us. 
This is the amazing announcement that John was tasked to spread across the dark land. The sunshine is about to crest the horizon and fill our lives with light. It's about to bring many out of the shadow of death and into the kingdom of God. Oh, all of us who are born in sin and then go on to practice sin, that sin separates us from God who is holy and pure in which there is no darkness at all in Him. Scripture is clear to teach us of our darkness. That all unregenerate people, all, all of us in sin, apart from Jesus, are darkened in our understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that's in us due to our hardness of heart. That's Ephesians 4.18. Darkened because the light that is spiritual life is not in us. The Apostle John has a gospel account. In the first chapter of his account, he says this, John 1, 6-8. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but he came to bear witness about the light. John the Baptist, Zachariah's son, the messenger, the announcer, the forerunner. His assignment was to testify and announce the coming of the light. I mean, what a job to have to get to be that person. But can I just remind you, can I ask you to join me? We too are commissioned with the same task today. We too are to let the light of Christ shine bright, to not keep it under a basket, that that those that God puts in our path would see it, and by His holy decree, believe and be saved. We are to be His witnesses. We are to be the, the announcers of this gospel news today. Let me ask you, are you doing that? Do you love the light that is Christ so much that you can't keep your mouth shut? That you see that that drive, that shopping moment, that classroom, that dinner table, that walk down the street is an opportunity to shine the light in the darkness. I get frustrated at the rhythm of our society, how pleased we are just to stay removed from people, kind of create our own little path and get really comfortable and not want people to mess with it. We we have these uh, vehicles of metal that we get to drive around secluded from others. And and then we get to sneak into our houses and close the garage door so I don't have to interact with my neighbors. And yet, the Lord breaks through that. And sometimes he causes us to go for a walk down the street. To hear a noise and go see if we can be a blessing. Or on a recent day, I was running by the house in the middle of my day for something. And one of my neighbors came riding by on his bike. Older gentleman, I've seen him before. We said hello. He knows I'm a pastor here in town talked about different things but on this day thankfully I didn't just do the quick wave and run in and keep going I slowed down and put my stuff down and God opened the door gave us an opportunity to talk and he had questions pastor he had he had big questions he had hard questions and uh, tears were shed vulnerability was had and uh, I'll hopefully get more time with that neighbor to be a light of Christ to him. It's a joy when God ordains to interrupt the flow of our day and we get to be a witness of his light to people around us. Let's leave this place today looking for those, right? Making time and room to take advantage of those. Some of the best parts of our day.
another clarity worth highlighting here in that John scripture I just read, first uh, John 1, 6-7, there was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. Saving faith in Jesus is not just about belief about him, it's belief into him. Trust in your life to him, dying yourself, giving your life to Christ. That, that's saving faith. And my prayer is that any of you who are listening to this today, maybe walked through these doors or are listening later, who are not yet believing into him, you don't belong to Jesus. That you would consider the depth of, of these things, of the reality of God's grace and mercy to send his only son to take on flesh, to live without sin, and then to die willingly in the place of we who are guilty so that we could have his righteousness, so that we could know his light, so that we could be renewed and reborn, forgiven of our sin, and reconciled to the holy God who is life. My prayer is that anyone listening today whom this is a clarity beyond just of historic value but is personal to you, that you would believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. That's John 20, 31. If there's someone here that you might know or any of us who are leaders, we'd love to know about what God's doing in you so we can walk with you in the newness of your faith. Maybe answer questions that are surrounding these things. Be a great joy to do that with you. Repent and believe and be saved. Notice that, that John 1 8, that John the Baptist was not the light. He came to bear witness about the light. Christ is the true light compared to the false lights of the world, right? Some of the things that we've been, the shiny things we've been pursuing for a lifetime. The things that we're in faith in Jesus are being sanctified in and how we handle those things and pursue them rightly. Jesus is also the true light in contrast to the dim or shaded light that was conveyed in the types and shadows of the old covenant. The rituals and the practices that came within. He is the true light. The unrivaled light. A.W. Pink says it this way. There is one glory of the sun, S-U-N, and another glory of the moon, and another of the stars, but all other lights pale before him who is the light. So hear these words again. Because of the tender mercy of our God, whereby the sunrise shall visit us from on high, to give light to those who sit in the darkness and in the shadow of death. He's doing that. He came to do that, and he's still doing it. Yes, we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, but he is with us, church. And he's at work, and he's saving more. This is the good news that we've come to know and celebrate. Jesus himself said in John 8, 12, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. Paul said in Colossians 1, 13 and 14, for he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of his son he loves, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. You can't light your own way. You can't produce a shiny enough of a light or a life that the Holy God sees you as righteous. No, he needs to look upon you and see the amazing, immense illumination of Jesus, the light that is Christ. Without him, you and I are powerless to escape the darkness. And, and, and without him, we're not going to make a way of sanctification in our life in this valley of the shadow of death. We need to be so reliant on him, so walking with him, seeing him that he's with us, empowering us, moving shaping us. That, that's, that, that's those wonderful words of Psalm 23. We'll close our hour to sing them together.
For those of us who repent of sin and trust our lives to Jesus, the light of the world is at work in us and through us. And it changes everything. 1 John 1, 5-7, This is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you, that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in the darkness, we lie, and we do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with him and with one another, and the blood of Jesus his Son cleanses us from all sin. Unbeliever, confess your sin and trust Jesus and know the light. Believer who has trusted Jesus, walk in that light. Walk in faith in Christ and let him sanctify and keep you in his light unto his purposes for your days. This is amazing gospel news that Zachariah is celebrating. He doesn't stop there. If you notice with me, he has one ad in verse 79. Another marvelous layer to the work of Jesus in the lives of those that he saves. That he will guide our feet into the way of peace. The light of the Lord leads us out of enmity with God and with others and leads us to a way of peace, a life of peace. And what we have to slow down and understand is this is a holistic peace. It is true shalom. It's not just circumstantial peace. A lot of times beauty queens and the people that are around you are talking about peace on earth and let's all get along and have peace. No, we're never going to know that kind of peace in this world where sin is at work. Right? You're not going to get to a place in your life where they're not getting along or, or, or your boss is everything you want him to be, you know, and, 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 you know, everyone you want to apologize. No, 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 that, that's not real. No, not in a world full of sin, not where darkness is happening all around. But we can know a peace that is internal and begins to affect us out. So Jesus brings that clarity. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give you, not as the world gives it to you. It's not the circumstantial peace that they're peddling. No, it's, it is a holistic peace. It's a peace that Paul will talk about in his letter to the Philippians that even in the midst of great trials, that, that we would not worry, but instead pray, Acknowledge the work of God and in, in that yielding to our Lord, walking with our Lord by faith, instead of clinging to things in worry, we would know a peace beyond understanding. Why? Because my circumstances are all better? No, the, the storm is still raging. The loved one's still about to die. The injustice is still about to throw you in jail. But you're not worrying. There, you are yielding to the Lord in prayer, you are walking in the light of Christ and there is a peace that you are experiencing that is beyond understanding. It is the peace of Christ. Now, I I could preach a whole other sermon on the way of peace uh, and I want to not do that this morning, especially because where we're about to go in chapter 2 is going to have some really important talk of what Christ is as peace in our lives. So we're going to get to more of that soon. I do want us to pause enough this morning to do business with the fact that Jesus is peace. We can't have true and lasting peace without him. Without his work on the cross, first Isaiah 53.3, he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities, The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. This is the work of the Deliverer. The good news that Zechariah is proclaiming that his newborn son John is going to go on to announce about the arrival of the Messiah, the Savior. Listen just again to this kind of final portion of this song, 76 through 79. You, child will be called the prophet of the Most High. For you will go before the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation to his people 
in the forgiveness of their sins. Because of the tender mercy of our God, whereby the sunrise shall visit us on high to give light to those who sit in the darkness and in the shadow of death to guide our feet into the way of peace. Do you notice that Zechariah includes himself in that last portion of verse 79? To guide our feet into the way of peace. Oh, how we need the Lord to guide our feet unto the way of peace. That we would trust in Jesus alone, that we would abide in Jesus alone. Therefore, we would be true peacemakers, as he'll speak of later. Jesus will say, blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons of God. No longer slaves to sin, no longer separated from the Holy God, no longer at war with everything. Peacemakers, clinging to the truth of God, walking in the love and mercy of God, in the way of peace. What a blessing, church, it is to belong to Christ. Amen? What an amazing moment this was in the life of Zechariah. What a testimony of God's eternal plan to redeem his people unfolding in this moment. After the conclusion of the testimony of this song, Luke, narrating these things, says in verse 80, the child grew and became strong in spirit, and he was in the wilderness until the day of his public appearance to Israel. Speaking of John, his young life until the, his public ministry that God ordained him to do began till it was time. Not yet time, right? He, John's just born, he's a baby. Jesus is in the womb of Mary, not yet born, right? Jesus is not going to begin his public ministry until the age of 30. So these two are going to grow. And then there's going to be a time where John's going to go to work, begin to announce the Messiah, as Jesus comes on the scene to go to work in his ministry. I want to save a further explanation and look into his life until that ministry, um, until we get to chapter 3 and really look to John's ministry. We'll peek back and consider what these days have been to him as he gets to work. So I look forward to that time with you, church. We'll probably be there in our journey together in the new year, 2024. Um, why? Because we're just finishing chapter 1, and we get to turn now to chapter 2. And if you have any understanding of your Holy Scriptures, chapter 2 has some text that you're probably very familiar with, even if you're brand new to the Holy Bible. The birth of the Messiah, the, the Advent, right? And so we're going to arrive at some Christmas narrative a little before the Advent uh, of December, uh, but it's going to spill right in. It's going to be a wonderful time to be um, getting to Christmas a little early, church. Um, so praise the Lord. Looking forward to that time with you, Lord willing, next week. Today, let's join Zechariah in seeing and savoring God's amazing grace and mercy to save so many of us who are guilty through and through. Let's join Zechariah to take hold of the life that God has saved us to live in these days, serving unto our Lord, testifying of the light of the gospel. Not only would we be saved by his grace, but we'd be sanctified by that grace as well. And it'd be his holy will that many more around us come to saving faith. That we, being delivered from the hand of our enemies, might serve him without fear. In holiness and righteousness before him all our days. Pray with me, church. Father, we thank you for this time together. Um, the, the joy it is to slow down the busyness of our lives, of our routines, to make a way to really have Sunday morning be an offering of first fruits. Uh, the very first commitments of our week would begin with time in your word together time together in corporate song, in prayer, fellowship, serving in the church. What a blessing it is, Lord, to slow and have this day set apart for you, to worship you, to honor you. 
that our heeding and hearing and processing these things would not now end at the end of the sermon, but in many ways would just begin to circle back to this text throughout our hours and days to come, to speak of the things that we're coming to understand with others as we go about our days. Lord, use us for your holy purposes today, if, if you're willing tomorrow. Help us to overcome selfishness and the sin that constantly is knocking at our door. We'd walk in your grace. We'd grow in sanctification. We would have faith in you. Thank you for the words of David in this beautiful Psalm 23. Let it be a a wonderful way to conclude our time together today as we worship you. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Let's sing together, church, and I'll come back.